There's arguably not a day in Portugal's history as impactful as April 25th, 1974. That day, a peaceful revolution overthrew an authoritarian government. It ended the colonial wars in Africa. It led to women having equal voting rights, the government releasing political prisoners, and the country adopting its present constitution. That day, Portugal as we know it, was born. But even though these events transpired in less than 24 hours, it was decades in the making. This is the Carnation Revolution with hindsight. The Portuguese Empire was one of the longest lived in human history. In the early 1400s, they started establishing their trade posts in every corner of the world. To as far as Japan, where they built the city of Nagasaki. But their colonial might was already in decline in the 1700s and 1800s. And around the turn of the 20th century, only a few colonies remained, particularly in Africa. But the 1930s saw a rebirth of colonial importance. This was the Estado Novo, or the new state. The government started referring to their colonial possessions as overseas provinces, and the Portuguese government promoted the concept of Portugal being a transcontinental country. The man behind all of this was Salazar. Salazar believed that Portugal wasn't a colonial empire, but it was a single transcontinental nation. He believed that their colonial administration was different from that of other countries, because they came from a warmer climate, and they themselves had a diverse racial history. He believed that this made them more humane, friendly, and adaptable to other cultures. Salazar came into power in the early 1930s, and he ruled the country as an autocrat. During the Second World War, he kept Portugal neutral, and this helped him stay in power. He then became a founding member of NATO, and his deeply rooted revulsion of communist beliefs made him a key ally to the West during the Cold War. Salazar was adaptable, he was smart, and a dictator. In the 1960s, he had already been in power for three decades, and this is when his rule began to crumble. The other colonial powers in Europe began abandoning their colonial possessions. Country after country won their independence, and their former colonizers promoted a new view on the world. But Salazar, did not bend. The colonies of Portugal saw the rise of nationalist movements who began an armed struggle for independence. Angola, Guinea and Mozambique became the central stage for the colonial wars and this lasted for well over a decade. But despite Salazar's firm stance on maintaining their colonial administration, he was very popular within his own country. The economy was thriving, and Salazar sought to promote the Portuguese identity and Catholicism. But that ended with an unfortunate accident. Salazar either fell from a chair or in a bathtub and suffered brain damage, and two years later he died. At that time Portugal sailed into very heavy weather. The country suffered double-digit inflation. Then, the 1973 oil crisis hit them incredibly hard, and the new prime minister wasn't that well-liked. All the while, the country was spending massive amounts of money on the colonial wars, and they were suffering human losses. This dissatisfaction built up over the course of a few years, and on the eve of April 24, 1974, the country was ready for a dramatic turn. 
In less than 24 hours, Portugal would be on a completely different track. The only few that saw it coming were members of the MFA. They had been secretly preparing for months, but remained in the dark. The MFA was an organization of mostly lower-ranking and left-leaning officers in the Portuguese army. Antonio de Spinola was an important thought leader. His book, Portugal and the Future, was released that same year and expressed unapologetic criticism on Portugal's military course. This lost him his job in Guinea, but his book struck a chord. The MFA was in hiding awaiting a signal. At 10.55 p.m. it came. A radio station in Lisbon played a song from the Eurovision Song Festival, organized earlier that same year. This put the MFA forces in high alert, but not yet ready to act. They waited. Until 20 minutes after midnight, another radio station broadcasted the words from a song that was banned from the radio by the government. This was it. The MFA forces set their plan in motion. At 3 a.m., they began occupying pre-chosen military targets across the country. In Lisbon, they occupied a television studio and two radio stations, and they blocked the antennas of another. They occupied the main airport the headquarters of the Lisbon military region, and they secured a large plaza where some of the country's most vital ministries are located. On the other side of the river, they set up an artillery battery, and in other places, in central and north Portugal, strategic assets were secured, most notably in the north in Porto, where at this hour, the MFA began their attempt to occupy the DJS, the secret police, during the dictatorship. At 4.20 a.m., the MFA broadcasted their first message. They announced that the airport had been occupied by the Army Infantry School. At 6 a.m., the MFA managed to occupy the ministries, the Lisbon City Hall and the Portuguese Central Bank. As many Portuguese started to wake up, the rebels had already gained the upper hand and the news spread around the world. All eyes were now pointed at Portugal. From that moment onwards, they broadcasted a message every 15 minutes. They said that they intended to liberate the country from the present government. They called on the army to avoid any dangerous clashes, and they told them to return to your barracks and await orders. And they warned commanders that all commanders that attempt by any means to force their subordinates to fight against the government will be severely responsible. And each message that they aired ended with the words, Biba Portugal. The people took to the streets in massive numbers to receive the rebel soldiers, despite urgent calls to stay safely inside. But the government had no plans of giving up. At 6.30 in the morning, a platoon that was loyal to the government arrived at the ministries. But after talks, they decided to side with the MFA. 15 minutes later, in another part of the city, the MFA receives intel that the Prime Minister is hiding at the headquarters of the National Guard. The government forces then took positions near the ministry buildings, but without confronting the MFA just yet. And shortly thereafter, a large military ship takes position in front of the ministries. There is a dead silence and everybody is tense. Then the soldiers aboard the ship receive orders to shoot but they refused to follow their orders. It can now escalate in seconds. Other soldiers that are loyal to the government arrive a few minutes later and take their positions. At 10 a.m., 
the RC-7 receives orders to shoot, but the commander refuses. He's then arrested by the brigadier, who then himself gives the soldiers the order to shoot. But the soldiers also refuse him, and the regiment surrendered half an hour later. The brigadier, who just ordered to shoot, had continued to the regiment on Arsenal Street. He orders them to shoot the lieutenant of the rebels with whom they had negotiated. But these soldiers also refused to follow his orders. A fistfight ensued between the brigadier and the commanding officer. The MFA, in the meantime, was continuing its advance. They sent troops to occupy the Portuguese Legion and they sent others to the headquarters of the National Guard, where the Prime Minister was still in hiding. But on their way there, they were confronted by troops that were loyal to the government. They talked, negotiated, and then decided to join the movement. The MFA continued their advance, and 15 minutes later, they arrived at the National Guard with a crowd of cheering supporters. They opened fire at the building to force the Prime Minister to surrender, but there was no answer. There was an air of excitement. The crowd was distributing food, milk and cigarettes to the soldiers and they gave them flowers. These flowers were distributed widely throughout the day and would later become a symbol of peace and democracy. But the Prime Minister had other ideas. He sent the military, the riot police and the National Guard who were now on their way to confront the rebels. Another helicopter, loaded to the brink with heavy artillery, flew over the city center. The excitement made way for anxiety. At 1.40 p.m., the Portuguese legion fell under rebel control. At 2 p.m., the military unit that was sent to confront the rebels surrenders and joins the MFA. Around that time, negotiations began at the highest levels between the Prime Minister and on behalf of the MFA, Antonio de Spinola. But there weren't any quick conclusions and the rebel troops were getting nervous. At 3 p.m., they announced through a megaphone in front of the building that they would blow up the gates of the National Guard and storm in if the Prime Minister wouldn't surrender. But no answer. Half an hour later, they shot with live ammunition at the building, but again, no answer. And at 4.15, it became ugly. The Portuguese secret police shot with live ammunition into the crowd and killed four civilians. Panic broke out. The MFA responded by putting an armored vehicle in front of the building and they began a countdown to open fire. But this was interrupted by a message from General Spinola. The Prime Minister and General Spinola had a phone call directly thereafter in which he famously said that he would not surrender to a general officer. He said that it would be throwing power into the street. But he's willing to surrender to General Spinola himself. At 6 p.m., General Spinola enters the headquarters of the National Guard and talks with the Prime Minister begin. They negotiate. They agreed that the secret police would be abolished effective immediately, as well as the Portuguese Legion and the Portuguese Youth, two organizations that were deeply entrenched with the right-wing government. At seven, the Prime Minister surrendered. He's taken out of the building and is driven to the MFA command post. 
as they were cheered on by enormous jubilant crowds. Even though General Spinola did not have a hand in organizing the rebellion, he was cheered on as the hero of the day. He was later appointed the first president of Portugal after the revolution. But he held on to the belief that Portugal should keep on to its colonial possessions. And he eventually clashed with revolutionary leaders. Watch one of these two videos next. The one on the left is my personal suggestion. And the one on the right is YouTube's best pick for you to watch next. So pick whichever one you prefer and I'll see you there.